this is the Dr. Deborah Show. This is the show where we talk about bringing peace and calm into your life. And later in the show, we're going to be talking about mental health stigma. We're live at KCSB FM Santa Barbara 91.9. KCSB is a platform for cultural expression and thoughtful discussion, providing a diverse educational forum. I'm a Santa Barbara-based clinical psychologist, and I specialize in pediatric neuropsychology. I've seen thousands of people, and my experiences are vast, and I want to share this information with you. I'm also a UCSB alumni, and I live in Santa Barbara. This show is all about our community, both locally and globally, and how to create compassionate conversations about our well-being and health. Today on the show, we're talking about mental health and well-being with a focus on women's equality with our very special guest, Supriya Vani. Supriya is a human rights defender, international journalist, Indian peace activist, and author of Battling Injustice, 16 Women Nobel Peace Laureates by Harper Collins. This was endorsed by many Nobel Peace Laureates and world leaders, including Mikhail Gorbachev, His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Juan Manuel Santos, the former president of Colombia, Sharon Stone, and many more. She's also on the advisory board of the Hague Justice Portal for Peace, Justice, and Security. Um, and only 10, 10 women of the 16 who have been conferred the Nobel Peace Prize are currently alive. In 2017, Supriya dedicated her book to Nadia Murad, the winner of the 2018 Nobel Peace Prize. And this is her sincerest tribute to all of the 16 women Nobel Peace Laureates' absolute devotion and relentless efforts for bringing sustainable peace with justice and equality. Welcome to the show, Supriya. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Yes, and welcome. We're so happy to have Supriya because she actually lives in India, but she's visiting the U.S., so we have this opportunity to uh, speak with Supriya and enjoy learning her wisdom. We're talking about mental health stigma and women's equality and also uh, prevention awareness. Um, And we're talking about this because mental health is the largest public health priority and the largest financial burden of any health issue in the world. And we're looking at mental health, which is when we find this kind of physiological balance with our nervous system, our heart, our brain, our gut. And we have an ability to organize and integrate our thoughts and feelings and have a sense of inner peace. We're talking about gender today because gender is a critical determinant, actually, in mental health and mental illness. Um, And gender determines the power and control men and women have over their socioeconomic, uh, you know, status, their mental health and lives, their social position, and their treatment um, in society. And therefore, also, that they become more susceptible and exposed to specific mental health risks. I was wondering, uh, Supriya, how would you describe mental health in relation to women's equality? Oh, well, uh, you know, we are kind of living in a patriarchal society. I mean, I'm just not talking about the Asian countries. I'm talking about the entire world. So we are living in a patriarchal, uh, you know, kind of a setup. And where women really do not have, you know... I mean, much rights and they don't have much same and like specifically in like countries in India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Bangladesh and all those countries. Mm -hmm. Uh, Well, India is definitely a largest democracy um, in the world and, you know, things are, are, you know, really, um, uh, you know, great now, but uh, I I mean, better now, you know, but uh, so this kind of things, you know, kind of gives a mindset to women and and they do not even know that if they're if they're being suppressed for example you know about what to wear and where to go you know where not to go what kind of hair you should keep and what kind of you know clothes you should wear so everything is kind of decided by the family members you know so when it happens and i'm not i'm just talking about the you know i'm just talking about certain sections of the society sure. you know yeah yeah of course so so what really happens is they don't even know that they're being suppressed, and what what happens that it's just kind of pent up, you know, and it and and they get into depression and they don't even know, and then we have you know so much I mean like so many problems like honor killing and, uh you know we have um, intercaste marriages or or you know all all these kind of things, kind of you know snowballs into something which is very dark mm-hmm. and it leads them 
to depression and many other mental problems. So I would say that if we have gender equality, then I think we'll be able to fight uh, you know, all these kind of mental problems. Yes, that so, was, I agree yeah. completely. And even though I know that you're in a different part of the world, I still feel that, I mean, in, in my practice where I see patients or in my daily life, I still do encounter, you know, a lot of uh, misogyny in our world. And so Absolutely. I think, <clears throat> unfortunately, you probably have it to a much greater degree in the region of the world you're in. But I still think that's important for us to know about so we can support you and learn from you. Um, and, and it is so true. I mean, they actually found that gender differences um, affect the rate of, of mental disorders and that women predominate. So usually women have more mental health issues. But I don't know if that's actually accurate. I just think that's the way it's slanted. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, I think when we talk about mental health stigma, we think of social stigma where there's attitudes and discriminating behavior that are directed towards individuals with mental health problems because they've mm-hmm. been given a label or their self-stigma where the person internalizes their you mm-hmm. know, label they've been given. And I think gender-specific risk factors for common mental disorders, you know, do disproportionately affect women. Um, you know, and I think that they're based on violence, socioeconomic disadvantages, low income, you know, an income mm-hmm. inequality, low or subordinate social status and rank. And then also there's an unremitting responsibility for the care of others. Women care for so many people. So I think that, yeah. you know, that it's an important thing to address, that, to look at women and how, what role we play and how to support women. Mm-hmm. Um, I, do you think that the mental health impact of like long-term, you know, cumulative psychosocial adversity, do you think that that's been adequately investigated or looked at in your experience just of interfacing with people around the world? Well, you know, what I personally feel is that, uh, uh, you know, people try to sideline such kind of people who are, you know, who are suffering from such kind of mental disorders. And and that is a wrong thing. And they have this, you know, all kind of preconceived notions about it, you know, okay, that this girl is, you know, into depression or or, or maybe she's, you know, I mean, suffering from OCD or, or like some other kind of, you know, depression. So... They are always looked, uh, you know, down, and and that's and that's what I feel that if you just uh, you know wait these kind of taboos and just accept them, because I personally feel that, I mean, you know, like some people are very vocal about accepting things. Some people are very shy and mm-hmm. they don't really talk about it. Mm-hmm. So the people who wait who don't talk about it, you know, and and they keep pondering over such things and that leads them to depression and many other, you know, kind of mental disorders. Sure. And then we get and 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 there is there is one thing which I really need to talk about is the issue of stalkers as well, you know. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yes. You can uh, yeah. Talk, yeah, if you with stalkers you mean would you want to tell us we could jump into that. That's fine. And uh, no, why I'm saying about stalkers also is that uh, that because in the online media and everyone, so girls get, you know, I mean, uh, you know, harassed in social media and, you know, they've been stalked in portion also. That also leads them into depression because they don't know whom to share. Right. It's like sexual. You know? It's also like sexual violence, I think, in some ways. I mean, even though it's done through a computer, <clears throat> yeah. you know, that sometimes women become... You know, they think no, they spe- try to trace. Yeah, of course, and they try to trace you down, and they try to find your location and stuff like that, and they try to track you. So, and and it is a crime. But if, uh, but imagine if this is happening in a patriarchal society, in extreme rigid rules, a girl cannot really tell her parents or something like that. You know that I've been stalked and stuff like that, because they will say that okay, the fault is with the girl, the fault is not with the boy. You know what I mean? Well, and also so, they don't believe the woman sometimes, right? A, absolutely, absolutely, and, and and the kind of rapes we have in India. I mean, India is a fantastic country, but you know, uh, but there are certain sections, and, and I think that's a global issue. I, I mean, like some news come up and some don't. And I think so, in, I think in America it happens not to that degree, but I do think it happens in, in the exact way you're speaking about, where women, you know, especially young women, have sexual encounters where they are taken advantage of or raped or abused. And mm-hmm. and then they go to tell someone and they're not believed or they have a lot of shame or maybe like you're saying their personality is more private and so they don't want to tell anybody. 
and and then also they start to question themselves and wonder if that's something they should have they deserve and that leads to suicide and that leads to suicide exactly okay is that happening exactly. in india is that a common outcome Oh, you know what? I mean, I mean, there uh, there are certain states. I would not say the entire, uh, you know, entire country. No, there are just certain regions in India where if a girl is being, uh, you know, raped, so they will just say that it's the girl's fault. Okay, so they will say, oh, maybe she was not dressed properly. Right. You know what I mean? Right. They blame oh, it on may- the Yeah. So it's just always go. Oh, maybe you know she was she was just you know I mean. You know, walking on their road at twelve o'clock in the night, or maybe that's the reason that she got raped. So well, it's always women's fault. It's so fascinating because there's just this high prevalence of sexual violence to which women are exposed to, and then there's a corresponding rate of post-traumatic stress disorder following, you know, like such violence, which renders women the largest single group of people affected by that disorder. And and they and they and they see them, you know, through through the eyes of. Uh, victim and then they label them and stuff like that so that leads to just you know suicide rates and many other things so i think the mental issues and everything starts from a very small age you know when when your ch- uh, you know when your classmates kind of bully you you know for you know for not having a flashy iphone or whatever it is or, or, or you know and not wearing bright right. clothes or stuff like that so you know i mean i mean very few people talk about it, you know, what a small child goes through, you know, in in all these kind of circumstances, because he... Oh, we're cutting. Are you there still? We got cut out. Oh, are you there, Supriya? So this kind of, you know, gives a base, and then the problem starts. Right, and I think from the time that we're children, I do talk about this on each show, you know, we notice the differences in others, and then we're taught to look at the world from the lens of our upbringing and the life experiences that shape us. Mm -hmm. And some of us, I think, are wired, you know, maybe we can overcome adversity easier, and some of us, like a thermostat on our, you know, how we use our temperature at our home. But I also think some of us, you know, cannot overcome those adversity because really um, the challenges can be quite large, you know, to overcome. (laughs) You know, but we can, uh, but we can definitely overcome if we you know, like children, not taught a very tender age about right. kindness, yep. about compassion, mm-hmm. and to and to you know uh, cherish the cultural diversity. I mean, to cherish the racial diversity, and if you know, if we kind of give them this kind of. Uh, you know, based, and I don't think so that the mental problems and all the, you know, will be of that. Uh, oh, know, I, agree. Like, I agree. I agree. Compl- I think, we, yeah, we need to restructure our gender specific ideas and also <laughs> our economic and social policies, you know, that cause, yes. you know, sudden disruptive and severe changes to women and their income, their employment, their social capital. And I think that, you know, we could reduce gender inequality and also reduce the rate of, you know, these more common mental disorders. So, I, I mean, do you think in India, I mean, are women, are they encouraged to get mental health treatment for those like post-traumatic stress disorder or other things going on? Um, I don't think so. Yeah. No, I don't think so. They don't uh, even think no, about no, that. no. You know, they just, okay. And because I, you know, as I mentioned earlier, that they don't even know they're having some kind of mental problem then they need to see a doctor you know well uh, you know so that they yeah. feel easy and they feel uh you know like a little comfortable just like you know uh, i mean uh, i mean so this kind of talks are not really prevalent there in like certain sections of society but if you talk about delhi and mumbai and if you talk with elite section definitely you know i mean they do i mean they are pretty vocal about it but but the normal portion living in India won't even know. Right. And, and that's not only India. That uh, That's global. Well, I mean, I, I think um, that's everywhere yeah. because stigma can just, it affects all these feelings of shame. And then the person doesn't seek treatment, you know, and then they have these stigmatizing attitudes toward themselves. You know, they take on what other people think about them. And so, yeah, it's so important for us to take care of our mental health by being able to discuss emotions, thoughts and feelings, you know, within ourselves. Um, do you think that, you know, this gender bias that occurs also like in the treatment of psychological disorders, I mean, is in India and other places you've traveled, do you notice if communities are having compassionate conversations about well-being and health, uh, mental health or no? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's exciting. You know, I mean, like people, 
do talk about mental health and they accept people, you know, um, um, regardless of their background or whatever it is. Nice. So, uh, yeah. And I would like to give a lot of examples in this, okay? I mean, for example, I would say that... um, Malala Yousafzai, for example, I mean, they're in Pakistan. So, you know, when she was, uh, you know, talking about the goal rights and everything. So that was also kind of a taboo, you know, or, or you know, Tabakul Karman there in Yemen who got the Nobel Peace Prize in 2011. So she was born in a kind of society where men are fed more than women. So you can imagine a child was born in that kind of uh, you know mindset so they they uh, they they already feel inferior okay mm-hmm. you know what i mean but still but still if you are bold enough and you need to be mentally strong to fight this okay and and when you are strong enough and you fight it and you fight the odds and you know and and you are a bond rebel then you can fight the system and all these problems will just, you know, vanish because it. I think the most important ingredient is how strong you are mentally, despite your depression, despite your other mental problems. But if you have strong uh, determination, then, Mm -hmm. I mean... You know, everything is possible. Well, you probably, you you probably, I love that idea too, that anything's possible and that we can overcome this. And I do think that by facing and addressing some of these issues and resolving them, that we could have more world peace for sure. And I know you interviewed all these, you know, amazing women that are Nobel Peace Prize winners. Is there anything universally they talked about, about how to move toward that or what they tell themselves, like you're talking about this kind of stamina internally of believing in yourself and even it's if you're... just about believing in yourself mm-hmm. and just always be in pure bliss mm. that's that is the most important thing how do you and yeah mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah 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 please go ahead oh, i was just gonna ask how do you think you you get um you know the pure bliss and also this kind when of- you know okay you know i mean i mean uh there is a story i mean there are two wolves in us okay one is a bad wolf and one is a good wolf, okay? So it just depends on you know, how much you feed, you know, them. So if you feed mm-hmm. the good wolf more, mm-hmm. then obviously, you know, true. then you'll be a good person. Mm-hmm. And if you have the right amount of compassion and kindness and, like, you know, empathetic joy, then these things do not really matter. I, and I, they you fall say away. that mm-hmm. how do you really gain it is that when you see, you know, people not, not because of their, you know, color or their race or whatever it is. So, you know, when often people talk about it, that I'm a global citizen. And for some people, it's just a fashion statement because it looks so cool. But I say that I'm a global citizen, but I mean it. And when I mean it, I say people who are born in Syria are also, you know, I, I am also concerned for them. I'm also concerned for people here in, you know, Chicago or like here or, or like anybody for that way. Well, I like in Pakistan. Yeah. So if we have this kind of universal values in you that we are all one uh, under the sky, then all these kind of issues will not. I mean, I mean, all these issues are because that I'm superior to you or or some people are hyper nationalist. OK, so all these kind of problems are like to so many other, you know, like other kind of problems. It's just not the mental issues there. I mean, I mean, they're much more to it. And they pass it on to their children and they just hate people for no reason. So well, if you just avoid it and just stay calm and just see the world as, you know, that we are all one. Mm-hmm. I think we have a solution to it. Well, like the Dalai Lama says, we're all breathing in the same air. And I like that idea. You know, Absolutely. We're not any different. Right. So kind of trusting this bliss within yourself, letting some of also the power from those other suppressing, you know, kind of dominating forces that are putting down women to not feed into that. And I know um, I have this minor in global peace and security I got here at UCSB and and we talked a lot about terrorism, you know, politics, the Middle East and those topics. And one of the things we talk about is not feeding into the terrorist kind of attitude of, you know, giving them more power by living in fear or giving more voice to that and really like you're saying giving more of a voice to yourself and not feeding into that Um, because I think that actually this uh, hatred or you know suppression of women really um, can be like a terrorist on women and uh, terrorize us in many ways and so I think we can turn to ourselves and really just let that float away and, and believe in ourselves and 
And also, I think we can find support from other people like you and I, or, you know, we kind of all work together. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think that it's fascinating, too, that women do seek more help, actually, than men. And actually, they also disclose, just globally, supposedly, they do disclose more mental health problems to their primary care physician. While men are more likely to see their mental health care provider and, and maybe go into a hospital, wait till it's completely, you know, much further down the road. Um, but I think that gender stereotypes regarding, you know, proneness to emotional problems in women and, and they appear to reinforce this kind of social stigma and constrain help seeking along these stereotypical lines. So it's like a barrier um, that we have to overcome. Also, I just think it's a new way of thinking because, I mean, for so many centuries, right, we've been, women have been treated this way. So this is a very new cutting edge idea. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? Yeah. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. I mean, I do think, I know you're saying that you don't think that mental health is the primary piece, but I also think if we were able to reduce mental health stigma and then we'd be more accepting of each other's differences, then maybe we no, can reduce violence. No, this, no, this is it. This is very, very important. I didn't say that it's not. What I'm trying to say there is that this is the fifth stage, and if we, if we fight this, if we fight this kind of battle, we'll be able to fight other battles as well. For sure. Well, I know in America, women are less likely to disclose a history of violent, you know, victimization. Unless, like, they go to a doctor and that person asks about it directly, which is very uncommon. Mm -hmm. How do you think that our healthcare systems could integrate, you know, asking questions about, you know, a woman's feelings in the world? Well, this can only be done that, you know, if you just become neutral and you stop judging people. Mm. Because they are only fair because they don't want to be judged. Okay. So they know what they don't want to be judged. And people judge so so quickly. You right. know. Right. So if yeah, exactly. So if we can just get away with all this kind of judgmental mentality, we have a solution to it. Well and I think that's that what I that's so true. I mean, the labels stem from mi misinformation and isolation and negative attitudes. And, you know, it's really Thanks. like a, it's like a lack of understanding about a behavior. And then, absolutely. And then absolutely. That, and, you know, and then that appearance of communication gets labeled as not being normal, which leads to further rejection and then an increase in mental health and, and also worsening of health conditions. So um, I do think, you know, I mean, at the crux of all of this, we just need to be able to talk about our well-being and to discuss, you know, these emotions, thoughts, and, you know, feelings. Um, I mean, I know that studies do indicate that most people learn about their primary source of information is through mass media. Do you think globally that that's accurate as well? Or how do you think the best sources of information are disseminated or given out? I think social media. I think social media. Mm hmm yeah, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, there's so many videos, you know, about positivity, about how to fight the mental disorders and stuff like. Well, I had a friend, okay, so um, and she was suffering from schizophrenia, okay, and she was, she was so helpless, and she used to drink her own pee, thinking mm -hmm. that she's saving water from the planet. You know what I mean? Right, that happens. Yep. Okay, and uh, and her husband left her, and she was kind of abandoned. So I and and you know she was uh, I mean she was having an um, eleven year old kid, and um, I told her uh, you know I mean uh, that you don't have to give up. So she was on her medicines and everything, and then I kind of encouraged her to write a book about her journey. Okay. And, and, and then she started writing about the book and about her journey about, you know, about like what, you know, what kind of circumstances, uh, she was going through, like, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So what really happened after that, that her book got published and now she feels much more confident talking about these kind of issues because she took this mental issue mm -hmm. as an issue of peace and she wanted to tell the world that, yes, you know, we all can make a difference in the world. So what I'm saying is, I mean, John Nash, I mean, I mean, he was a Nobel laureate, right? And he was also having some kind of, uh, you know, issues. But still, it, that's what I said, that if you are mentally strong and you know that you have, you know, you have issues, but still there is one side of it. 
in your heart, which is strong enough to fight it, mm. you will fight it. Mm, I love that. Your heart. Yeah. I mean, I think we don't turn, especially in America. We don't listen to our hearts and our heart is really like another brain, um, mm. you know, that we need to listen to. I don't know if you saw that this uh, year's annual Time Special magazine, you know, they do a special every year for their Time uh, okay. magazine. It's last year was on mindfulness meditation. This year it's on mental health. And on the back cover, it says every person will have mental illness. I mean, I like to use mental health issues, but I think everybody interfaces with mental health issues. And I think that's also how we sometimes turn against other people is because we're suffering so much ourselves. Mm -hmm. I love how you supported that friend and you stood by her, even though she was, like you said, drinking her own pee and having schizophrenia and raising a child and probably really suffering in a, a tremendous way that other people didn't want to be around her, maybe, I guess. Yes, yes, and yes. And so yes, I think that I takes know. a lot of courage and strength. But but out of it came something really beautiful, you know, for mm -hmm. her and for you. So I think that's why it's absolutely. so important for women to support absolutely. each other. Absolutely. You know, absolutely. So what I just have to say that I want people not to give up not to give up well i personally was kind of suffering from depression you know i was in depression uh you know in like 2011 and 12 you know things were not happening and i was stuck and you know what i mean so yeah. but yeah and like everything was was you know was was so bad and i used to feel you know crazy. i mean like terrible but I just told myself that I'm not going to give up. Mm -hmm. I'm going to fight it. Mm -hmm, okay. The will to fight. I'm going to fight it. So I just started of thinking that, no, I have to fight it no matter what. So if that, you know, if you have that kind of fighting instinct and in a way passed away, you know, mm -hmm. then you can do things and you can change the world. And I would like to give an example about the child soldiers. Sure. You know, they're in Africa. Okay. So. You know, the war criminals like Joseph Kony, Boko Haram, or even the former president of Liberia, Charles Taylor. Mm -hmm. So what these guys used to do is they used to abduct, you know, boys of like 10 to 15 years. They used to disfigure their face, mm. okay, yeah. completely. And it used to tell them to rape their own mothers and rape their own sisters, okay. And after that, they were ordered to kill their own mothers and sisters so that... You know, they just completely, uh, you know, uh, demolish themselves. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, even the last sense of humanity just goes away from mm. their heart. So they become a complete, uh, you know, monster. So, and then giving them guns in their hands just to kill people and then recruit them in their army and say, oh, yes, you are the child soldiers. I've just said company or, you know, Charles Taylor for that matter. And used to go in the streets, sitting in the jeeps and killing people just for fun. You know well, what I mean? They say that an estimated 80% of 50 million people, so that's like 35 million people or 40 or something. It's a high number mm -hmm. um, that are affected by, you know, vi that are affected by violent conflicts, civil wars, disasters, displacement. And as you're saying, mm -hmm. it's not just women. I mean, it's women and children of both, you know, of ages. Of course. But then dealing with the psyche of such children mm. and molding their mind into positivity is a challenge. Okay, telling them that you're on the wrong path. Right, because they're know? not naturally that way. I think babies naturally want world peace and yeah. <laughs> the things that we're talking about, too. No, I, I mean, no, what I'm saying, a 14-year-old boy killed his own mother, he killed his own son, and because he was told to kill otherwise... You know, you won't be able to, you know, join the group of Joseph Kony for that matter, the number one war criminal in the world from Uganda. So what I'm going to say that if you have those children, I mean, 14, 15, 16 years, I mean, so how to change that? Okay, how to change the mentality? Now, that is also a challenge. So I, and they don't even know that the, whatever they're doing is, is, is morally, ethically wrong. And to change that kind of mindset requires a lot of hard work requires a lot of hard work well, because I, yeah. it's, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think, well, women are daring, you know, to, to like you're saying, to disclose their problems. Um, and I think that also even these women and boys, I mean, so they basically, you're saying these boys that are put into these predicaments where they're, they're kind of brainwashed and trained really to hate themselves, to be, you know, demoralized, to be disfigured. And then to also hate their families, which is really, I mean, and then you're saying that the leaders really don't have any understanding that what they're doing is immoral? 
No, leaders, the leaders just need power, okay? Right, right. Because they are, they are war, war criminals. They just, you know, abduct a bunch of girls and rape them and make them pregnant and make their wives, say 100 wives or 99 wives. You know what I mean? Right. Okay. Yeah. So they don't have any sense of morality. What I'm talking about the children, I mean, a 14-year-old boy, okay? He is, you know, you know, for him, you know, being the, you know, being a child soldier, he doesn't even know that he is a child soldier. For him, he's a soldier, and he's fighting for his leader. You know what I mean? Right. Well, so, I mean, yeah. I think yeah. that the pressure that's created by, you know, multiple just roles, gender discrimination, poverty, hunger, malnutrition, overworking, you know, domestic, all these things contribute to the to these poor, you know, situations. So, no, but I would say the highest level of mental torture is in the war zones or in the areas where we have, you know, people like um, who are like you know, Boko Haram or Joseph Kony. For example, children who are from Syria or, Ye- or, or Yemen and a five year old person or just maybe 10 year old girl, okay, seeing her parents being bombed, you know what I mean? So, right. that thing, you can't just take it away in just a few months. That will take time for sure so yeah well and what i my research that's the kind of let's go ahead that's the kind of what now so i mean you know that is a kind of a challenge you know for us that how we can you know make them feel comfortable and how we can just remove such kind of memories from their mental album because those memories get etched into the mental album so badly that it's not even depression i don't know what kind of thing it is a kind of a trauma Oh, that for sure. It's, trauma, best, oh, it's very severe. Well, seeing blood everywhere and you're just 10 years old. Okay, you know, you were just having nice cake and everything was, was, was just yeah. fine. Yeah. And, you know, hey, you got a bomb and your whole family is dead and you are it's there. Hard so to, it's, just, it's hard to process. It's hard to come to terms with that. You know, to imagine that, you know, well, happening I, or thinking about that that I actually happened. I have met such kind of people. Yeah, exactly. So I have met such kind of people and it's so hard to talk to them because they won't speak. Mm. It's so hard to They're talk like to them. You know, They're like shocked. Yeah. They don't know, and they won't cry, they won't talk, and, you know, and you feel helpless. Extreme. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just, I mean, you give them a chocolate, they're not interested. You give them anything to eat, they're not interested, because they are in trauma, well, and, like, such kind of trauma, because, I mean, seeing, the, you know, death of, your, you know, of your family members is not easy, oh, or, or, yeah. or then killing your own family members in the case of, you know, um, uh, you know, the, war, uh, um, the warlords, uh, they're, they're in Africa, and still... You know, uh, I mean, the police are searching for it, but still, I mean, no trace for them. Right. Well, the research I did is that in most central uh, cities and places around the world, those patients aren't recognized and therefore they're not treated. And the communication between like health workers and those patients is usually very extremely authoritarian in many countries. And that makes it hard for someone to disclose, you know, the psychological or emotional distress uh, that they've been through. And, and then when they do dare to disclose them, I've, I, I mean, at least the research I read is that many health workers actually tend, especially toward women, to have gender biases, which can lead them to, to uh, maybe untreat or overtreat or undertreat the, uh, the person. I mean, do you think that these kids are able, you're saying that you've met with them, are they able to get treatment? Is, is there, are there obstacles to that, too, for them to get help? Well, I would say that majority of the people do not get any kind of, you know, uh, you know, support because they are not even documented. You know what I mean? No, I don't. You mean like in the country they're living in, they're not supposed to be there? No, 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 no. I don't mean that. Okay. And what I mean is that, so you know, people who are in Syria, people who are who are in Yemen, okay, and. Uh, you know, their uh, their whole family is kind of destroyed by like bombs and everything. So, they, there is no one to take care of them, and and there are so many wonderful NGOs, and you know, I mean, UNHCR is also working for it. But still, still, you know, I mean, I mean, they get you know misplaced and they go to some other country. They don't know, and like some people make use of it, you know, especially the gold child, and they sell them, you know, what so. It's not a problem. So, and they sell them for like some, like $10, $20, and that's it. It's horrible. And I'm, yeah. So, and yeah. 
So we have, you know, human trafficking in these. So a person who's got, tra- you know, got like trapped in human trafficking, I would be able to go to the health department and say, you know what, this happened to me. He will never be well, able to make it. I think that's, that's why it's important for just everybody, even if you're not a mental health worker or a medical care worker. I mean, I was, I remember I saw something on, I don't even have TV, but I did see something on a news blurb about a woman who was an airplane uh, stewardess, and she saw this woman on this plane with this man, and the woman looked very dazed and out of it. And she just kind of trusted her intuition to check in with that woman because the woman, like you said, wasn't talking. She wasn't answering any questions, and she just knew there was something awry, you know, missed something off, and ended up connecting with her somehow, and turned out she was a human trafficking. You know, they were trying, in America, they were trying to take her out of America. And so you've got girls, you know, young girls here and boys being trafficked. I mean, how do you think we could work like as a global community to to resolve that, to stop? Because I do think that that relates to mental health stigma, actually, because I think that children also are stigmatized and taught to believe that they're less than. And well, yeah, yeah. Uh, well, like speaking about human trafficking, you know, I mean, Nadia Murat, who got the Nobel Peace Prize on 10th of December, was a former sex slave of ISIS. Mm. Okay. Yeah. So she was lucky enough to escape, and then she got the support of Amal Clooney, and of course, later on, you know, Angela Merkel, and, and, you know, her story can just, you know, will was just, I mean, rip you apart the way she was actually molested. And all the Yazidi girls were, were were molested by ISIS, you know, gang raped, and they used cigarette butts and whatnot to harass all these women. So, uh, you know, you, you said that how we can work against human trafficking. Well, there are all so many wonderful organizations like Ella Satyarthi, uh, you know, Foundation, and he got a Nobel Prize in 2014 along with Malala Yousafzai. And there are so many organizations, you know, and what they do is that they kind of keep a track of things and they're very, very vigilant about, you know, if there is a small girl going on a train, uh, uh, you know, with a strange kind of a man and she's not feeling comfortable, just call, you know, the police and just to show that, that, you know, just to make sure that that girl is, you know, kind of related to that man or is being abducted, you know? Right. I, mean? I think in America, too, I mean, if we do see something suspicious, it is, I mean, I think we're taught not to call the police here, but I know my practice, like I have patients that have things going on that are clearly, you know, should the police should be called. And I think that sometimes people think they're going to get arrested, but, you know, the peace will come and keep what they call keep the peace. At least in America, they do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and also j- just if you see something suspicious to act on it, it doesn't mean you may be incorrect, but, I mean, you also might save somebody else's life, too, from Absolutely, you know, absolutely. But, you know, people won't do it because some of them are like, oh, why should I bother for this, you know? Right, so it's also you know, changing I mean, our mentality. Are, mm-hmm. Exactly. Some people are so indifferent, they don't care. And, uh, I mean, they, I mean, actually, they need help to be a little more compassionate, you know, because if you're not compassionate to your fellow human beings, then we're just like animals, you know. Well, I know. I think we've kind of lost our way with our uh, using our compassion because compassion is built into us. I mean, it runs from our brainstem to our mm-hmm. lungs, to our heart, to our gut. And so it's a very natural part of us. But I think we've just forgotten it. We've like moved so far away. And I think that also just that our world is at a crucial crossroads and people are feeling the the pressure from that. And some people do things that are abusive and hurtful to other people. And some people, you know, collaborate and work to try to create more peace. So it's there's a division there. But I mean, I, I think what you're talking about is that these severe life events that happen, um, they, you know, they cause this great sense of loss, inferiority, humiliation. They become entrapped. And, of course, that's a prediction for, you know, depression or other mental health issues. And I think everybody, you know, just to clarify depression, too, is that everybody gets depression and anxiety. I think, you know, obviously some people have it to the point where it takes over their days. And it's okay. You know, we, we all get that where we feel like staying at home, having some mashed potatoes or, you know, being in our pajamas or not talking to people. I think the key is to how to, to know what you need and how to check in with yourself. Um, mm-hmm. And allow yourself to feel those things because we're not going to feel great all the time. And then that will allow us to be more present for other people, you know, and then stand up for things you believe in or or research issues that are important to you, like what we're talking about with women's. And, and I, I guess we're just talking really about reducing violence in the world. Um, 
and creating this peace, right? They're absolutely, <clears throat> absolutely. I noticed that I, the World Health Organization. Were you going to say something? I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Okay, yeah. Because okay, we're ahead. yeah. Just so our listeners know too, we're doing this kind of recorded, so uh, it's a little bit different than our usual show. So thanks for your patience with any technical things. Um, mm-hmm. The World Health Organization's focus on women's mental health is to build evidence on the prevalence and causes of mental health problems in women as well as on the mediating and protecting factors and then also to promote more formulation and implement implementation of health policies that address women's needs and concerns from childhood to old age and their idea the world health organization's focus is on enhancing like competency with with health care providers so they're more educated and they're more aware of these issues And then also recognizing um, and treating mental health consequences of domestic violence, sexual abuse, and acute and chronic stress, you know, in women and children. Mm -hmm. So I think that they have a good outline. Do you interface at all with the World Health Organization? Because I know you're involved with the Hague Committee, and maybe you could share a little bit about what is going on in that realm, if there's something that you think is applicable that we could learn from. No, I don't know, uh, you know, about the World Health Organization, so I wouldn't be able to comment on that. What about the Hague? I know you do something with them. Well, it's, it's just about, uh, well, it's just about, uh, you know, the war crimes. You know what I mean? It's just about the war crimes and mm-hmm. it's uh, and it's serious violation of human rights. So it is, it is about when you are when you're actually dealing with the monsters, you know, and, you know, you know the tyrant rulers and stuff like that so it is and of course um um it is just about uh especially about the war you know like war crimes and human trafficking uh, cyber crime and so so all these kind of things well and i mean those are really at the tip top of of what makes you know things kind of go haywire Mm -hmm. um yikes yeah, so you're, how, why do you think there isn't like a hard and fast kind of line, you know, like drawing a line in the sand, so to speak, of these violations against human rights? <clears throat> well, there is a violation of human rights. Isn't I know, it? I, no, there is, but I mean, how come there isn't more action? Like, why aren't they saying, okay, no, this is absolutely not allowed. This is what we're going to be doing to address this and these different I know, the because I'll tell you what, okay. Well, I want to clear one very important thing which is people think that yeah like we all think that war is bad but you know what men make a lot of money out of it right they make a lot of money out of it military industrial and when you have lots of money coming in they don't mind sacrificing people for it and that is the violation Mm-hmm. That is a violation because people are so selfish. Right, I mean, greedy. some men in kind of particular, and I'm not saying really men, I mean, people who are in power and who are not good politicians mm-hmm. or who are not, you know, good, you know, heads of different kind of organizations. <clears throat> and me. they like money and they want money, okay? And their greed never ends. So. They don't mind, you know, like butchering a few thousand people and, you know, stuff I feel like, like we're so, just, I, I guess I'm very hopeful because I know you and I were talking the other day too. I mean, I keep thinking of Gandhi and how he said, out of turbulence comes peace. And I feel like <clears throat> the world is in this very turbulent time with all these different things that we're talking about and that we're really at a crossroads. So for me, I guess I do feel excited about the opportunity or, you know, for change. Do you yeah. feel that we're moving in that direction that maybe... Absolutely, have- absolutely. Yay. Things have changed. Things have changed so much, you know? So you, now, yeah. mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. now, you know, uh, there are so many NGOs and so many activists and everything. You know, we have doctors who are trying to, who, who, are, who are willing to help us. So, yes. <laughs> Things have changed. They're changing. Definitely. I know. I just yeah. want to help people to hold out hope and also, you know, to get get involved because it's a great way to, I think, turn your worry or your fears or uncomfortable ideas into action. You know, if you can get involved in a local group or a global group um, or even like Supriya is talking about helping a friend, you know, that's that's having going through a struggle it can be something, you know, just really close to home. I would. Yes, I would just. And no, she is, she was from uh, from Amsterdam. OK, mm-hmm. so uh, what I'm trying to say is that 
if, you know, often people say that, oh, you know, we can't go and help people. They're in the Middle East or they're in the U.S. or, or the American will say we can help you because, you know, there are geographical constraints also. I completely understand. But what I'm trying to say that, you know, you, you can just help your neighbor. Stop with that. Help your family member. Help your friends. And stop with that. That's true. Because it's like, as long as you're helping, you are doing good. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, I and think people try to, yeah, yeah, yeah sure. people try yeah. to, people try, I mean, like some people try to run away. Some people try to run away because they, they, they don't want any kind of mess. They don't want to waste their time on their friends and, you know, to solve their well, it's problems. Uncomfortable. And all. It's uncomfortable. Yeah. That's that turbulence that we were talking about. <laughs> Absolutely. But that is a challenge. And, you know, that's the sense of humanity. And if we can do that, mm-hmm. then you know, we don't have any right to say that we are, you know, that, that we are a human being. Well, I because, think people live in fear, you know, because and we brace ourselves if there's something new or something uncomfortable. I don't think so. There is any excuse to that. No, no, no there's fear no excuse. is that big. I just am, I'm saying I'm agreeing. No, no, I, of course, of course, I'm talking with the people. I don't think so. There is, there is any kind of, um, uh, well, there are two kind of fears, you know, what I, you know, one fear is that uh, about the judgmental mentality of the people. And the other fear is the fear which the victim, you know, you know, kind of suffers is, okay, you know, what if, you know, that I am being stalked, for example, or like this and that, or, you know, like somebody is trying to harass me. What if, 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 if I tell the world and what they will think of me? That is one fear. I mean, the other type of fear is that one, um, you know, person thinking, why should I help this person, you know, and that person will just, you know, I mean, take my time and stuff like that. And I'm okay. And I don't want to do that. So, you know, what if, you know, um, a police gets involved and stuff like that. So that is another kind of fear. But we just need to work on that, how we can overcome it. I guess I living in California, I look at it like boogie boarding. Do you know what boogie boarding is? Yes. <laughs> or, you know, it's kind of like surfing. And I grew up boogie boarding a lot because I've always lived by the beach. But it's, it's you know, you have to catch the wave, which can be challenging. And then once you catch that wave, it can get very rough and, and bouncy. And you really have to hold on. And then at the end, you kind of cruise out and you're kind of in this smooth <laughs> ride. And I do look at these obstacles or challenges in that way that, yeah, it will be rough. It will be bumpy. Um, but, you know, at the end, maybe you can kind of cruise out of that. And really in psychology, I mean, a good indicator of someone feeling better, or doing uh, things that are healthier for them, is they're more able to tolerate uh, things and not run away. And I also think we're more evolved than that. I mean, that's a very primal way to respond to problems is to run away. But I do think we've become that way, you know, like fight or flight, like a lion's chasing us. But we're not being chased by lions. I mean, we kind of are, but not not literally for our survival. I think we can use our minds and our hearts, like you're saying, and and evolve and grow. Absolutely. Do you, How do you feel that <clears throat> women's equality you know, supports or could help a person through a mental health crisis. I know you've given some good examples, um, but I mean, how do you think, I know you're talking about if we had more women's mental health or women's uh, ideas and these different leaders that you've interviewed, how they've um, implemented that into their life. How do you think that women's equality could help a person through a mental health crisis by, you know, believing in that or understanding that or using that? I will not say just about the mental disorders or, or the mental crisis, but I will say that holistically speaking, it will it will help them on a mental, spiritual, and physical level. Mm-hmm. Okay, I was on I was recently in Iceland and I interviewed the Prime Minister of Iceland, Katrin Jakobsdóttir, and uh, the gender equality is kind of you know I mean a kind of the World Economic Forum, Iceland is on number one okay in terms of gender equality so and they just recently passed a law about equal pay mm-hmm. um you know and that is why i feel that women who are from iceland are happy and you know i mean the ratio of discrimination is and that so if we have such strong laws everywhere in the world then you know then we can start right I mean, then we will have solutions to, you know, like such kind of issues. 
Does and so, in Iceland it would be a good role model country. I mean, do they have a systematic? I mean, they must have a systematic way that they've been implementing that and. And, uh, well, of course, and you know what? I mean, some people in Iceland don't even lock their doors because they know no, no one is going to come and steal their, um, uh, you know, things. So and, yeah, that you gives know, you happiness. <laughs> I mean, yeah, so that gives you happiness. The crime rate is so low. I know it's a small country; the population isn't that great, but that is a rich country, by the way. Number one, number two. Yeah. If you have such kind of laws in your country, so you know, women are not looked on just because they are women. No. No, not at all. I mean, Trudeau. I mean, Justin Trudeau is a um, is a feminist, or the, the Prime Minister of Canada, and there are many feminists. Read but, but I want to say that uh, only five percent of the uh, of the politicians in the world are uh, women. Okay, be Angela Merkel is okay. Mm-hmm. Theresa May, mm-hmm. um, Justin Arden from New Zealand, uh, Ethiopia's new uh, prime. Uh, President and Croatia, Lithuania. I'm just naming the countries who are having the female president or prime minister. Or well, they're having a female six. prime minister. I know there's a big movement, which is great. Yeah, and uh, yeah, and recently they're in Georgia. So the number is not really big. Okay, what I'm going to say is that women is a creator of the world, and it's the moral responsibility of the women to come at the central stage of all human affairs to take this challenge right. and. To help the world. So you're saying by these different countries taking on women's equality and just reducing violence. I know like in Iceland, I think they don't allow spanking and things like I think they outlawed that yeah. there. But reducing violence and like you're saying, um, kind of revamping the way the countries operate so that everybody collectively can work better together too, I guess, is what you're talking about. Absolutely. Absolutely. How do you think that we could put more um, women's equality into our lives, like just on a daily basis? Like, is there something we could be doing? I mean, I hear what you're saying. You've given a lot of great examples, but I was just thinking because we're, we're kind of getting near the end of the show, and I was thinking of a way of just giving people some little tidbits. It started a tender rage, you know. It just started a tender rage. If you teach your your children to respect women and to tell them that they are equal, because I'm not talking about just about the West, but I'm talking about the entire world, okay? Right. Because mm-hmm. I just recently, uh, you know, uh, told you that there are countries where, um, you know, the parents differentiate and they give more food to the male child and not to the girl mm. child. That's because they think that the girl will eventually get married. We need to get some kind of money for that girl. And, you know, the son will stay with us forever. So... You know, he is he is he is superior and they distribute sweets when a male child is born and they cry when a when a girl child is born. And I'm just talking about certain sections of society or and it actually depends on person to person. It has nothing to do with religion or your caste or class or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. Because I don't I don't believe in that anyway. So it just depends on your mental makeup. Right, so you're talking about at a, very strong. Young, mm-hmm, at a young age, just very starting out, giving knowledge and information and, you know, sharing those beliefs so that the person has the ability to have compassion and have a conversation about that. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, and yeah. I think we can do this by, you know, just starting to treat everyone as equal and reducing this is what discrimination. I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah, also exactly. and, and building inclusiveness to teach each other what we've learned. Um I know that in recent news that they're updating what they call the Mental Health Act, and that's to comply with international human rights legislation that's supposedly to ensure that people are not harmed or abused. Um, And I think that we also need to really prioritize trauma-informed therapies and focus on the causes of mental health issues rather than on the symptoms. Um, And then we can work towards having, you know, less war and more happiness. Um, yeah. but we do need to address these different gender stereotypes that damage everyone. It's not just, you know, women. Um, mm-hmm. I was researching, you know, some ways that we can look at like the different categories and it seems like, I mean, maybe you can tell me if there's any others I'm missing, but if we were to have these new approaches that would include covering reproductive and sexual health, human rights, uh, for women and consent, like in childbirth and, and caring for their children, equality in health to end violence against women, equality in aging and end of life care, 
building a workforce for the future for women and giving women equal access, you know, to um, to women's reproductive choices, and then you know, developing these social care policies. Um, so I, I don't know. Is there anything that you think of that that I left out that we could cover? That I mean, I know it kind of encompasses everything, but how we could develop these integrated care models. Are you there, Supriya? Uh, hello. Hello. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I couldn't hear you. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. There was a We're, problem. We have just a couple minutes, but I was just kind of wrapping up and covering how we can address, you know, these early gender stereotyping um, perspectives that damage everyone and how we can address the different kind of categories of, of areas that this covers with women's equality and, and how, you know, human rights. And the cover, the areas I brought up were reproductive and sexual health, human rights, and consent in childbirth, and caring, you know, maternal and paternal caring for the child, equality in health care to end violence against women, equality in aging and end of life care, building a workforce for women for the future, giving women equal access to uh, reproductive choices, you know, if they want to have birth control or what kind of contraception. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, you know, and then finally yeah. developing social care policies. Because, you know, women do live longer than men, and they make up a larger portion of the older age population. Um, and so I feel like we really, if we, like you're saying, we could start really at birth and then go through the whole lifetime in these different areas. Is there any other areas that you're thinking of that are important for, for reducing these stereotypes? And Yeah, we shouldn't have... Strong laws. We should have strong laws for it. Yes, you know, I agree completely. Yes, exactly. I'm, yes. I'm looking to you to help keep laws. keep doing this important work that you know that you've really. I know that you're you're traveling in the U.S. right now. I want to personally thank you for doing what you're doing because since I can't be out there, you know, or my family, we can't be traveling. Thank you for you know going and speaking up for something that's so important for all of us. Oh, thank you very much for your kind words. And, you know, as I said, that we should always, you know, try to do whatever we can do in our human capacity, you know, because we don't want to cut a sorry figure in front of our children when they ask that, Mama, when, you know, when the world was like this, so what was your role? Okay, right. so during the crisis, exactly. So it's just about it. So, so you know, I mean, whatever we can do... <laughs> So whatever we can do in our uh, in our human capacity, we should be doing it. Well, thank you for coming on the show. I mean, I so appreciate your your thoughts. Do you have any final words of wisdom for our listeners? I would just say that do not give up. Do not give up and have the mental strength to work for it. And that's it. Because you can defeat the world if you have the right mindset. Mm. And it's it's your mind which can take you to places. It's your mind, and if you're mentally strong, you can you know, I mean, you can battle anything. Okay, well, I mean, I think like, so. What Supriya is saying is that if you kind of just keep your mindset strong, and and don't give up, things might you know get hard or rocky. Uh, just kind of believe in yourself, and also just find your bliss, enjoy the world, and I you know I think we can work Hello. together to help create, you know, a supportive environment and that can empower and care for the individual. And yeah. some ways we can work together are volunteering, checking in with ourselves, learning about other cultures, getting accurate information from accurate, reliable sources. And this can lead to this understanding, including and caring. Can you imagine a world where we can share our feelings and thoughts more freely? And so if we each do our part toward ending these negative perceptions, and raise awareness we can live in a more loving, safe, and healthy world. So I want to thank Definitely. my special guest, Sufriana Vani, for coming in today yeah. and sharing her wisdom. Thank you for having me. Thank you for your kind words as well. Yes. Oh, and I'm so glad that you came in, and I'm hoping that people can really learn from this and implement it in their lives. If you have questions, please write to me on my Facebook page, The Dr. Deborah Show. I also want to put out a shout-out to HopeNet of Carpinteria. Um, HopeNet serves our community to work toward prevention and awareness for suicide. And if you know someone um, who needs help, call the National Suicide Prevention Hotline at 1-800-273-8255 
or the Santa Barbara Access Line at 1-888-868-1649. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you next week.